How's it going? Welcome to Swim Podcast, episode number 10. I'm Daniel P. Carter, and the someone who isn't me on this one is Maynard James Keenan of Pussifer Tool and A Perfect Circle. Uh, and when Pussifer were over here in London, they were playing at uh, the Roundhouse in Camden um, in support of their amazing album, The Money Shot. And they also recorded a Made of Ale session for my show on BBC Radio 1, which you can still check out online. You should do that. It's great. Anyway, so over the course of the next hour or so, we spoke about comedy, music, art, the creative process, mysticism, wine, a little bit of politics, all sorts. It's a good one. I hope you enjoy this. Um, please tell everyone about the podcast. And do remember that it is very much a labor of love. So don't steal the audio and stick it up on your YouTube channel because that's just not cool, is it? All right, this is Maynard James Keenan. Enjoy. There was so much going on with the show visually and it sounded impeccable as well and that place is notoriously bad sounding it's well, a, a really round, tough it's room. a round building it's hard to really get the sound right and depending on where you're standing the things disappear i would imagine yeah so you have to move around a little bit to really hear things properly yeah it sounded great and um it looked amazing yeah it was a tough room to kind of figure out how to fit the show in there but it that seemed apparently it worked out people yeah. seemed to like it yeah i think that was the general vibe how did how did you come about with the idea of the the look of doors and everything? Well, normally when we're doing our our shows, there's always a, a filmed element to it, and normally normally we're, we we uh, will kind of film bits so that we're do a couple songs, then we'll be doing some kind of activity while a video bit is going on. Yeah. Um, so kind of interim bits, um, and we went to we were going to go film the luchadors and kind of have a story attached to what they're doing and they were like why don't we just <laughs> why don't we just come out with you yeah. like all right <laughs> i like the fact that there was certain points like when you did the remedy there's there's almost like it becomes this theatrical piece where they're arguing and yeah and the dancing and stuff as well it was a good look yeah and it's you know they're very you know it's uh the luchador thing's probably a little odd for the English to quite grasp, but there's yeah. you know, this whole cultural, cultural thing down in the Southwest and uh, the Mexican luchadors. Um, I think it's there's more of a story. A lot of the characters have their stories attached to them, so people kind of follow those characters yeah. like they would a soap opera. It's less. I don't. You know. I guess I would have to talk to the guys to see what the separation is. But it's less. Uh, it's less um, bombastic than like the the WWE stuff you know the breaking the chairs over the guys and it's it's still athletic you know it's very you yeah. know if you see the acrobatics that the, that they're going through i mean the, uh uh eli last night had a concussion he had the russian could take him to a memetic the wow. the little guy oh was that he, yeah he actually hurt his he actually had a bad fall yeah where he was i saw the bit where he got like a pile driver from the top rope yeah that was probably the i would yeah. have thought <laughs> yeah. yeah amazing and the cockfighting was amazing as well just, and something that that I think that every time you know every time you've done something with um, Pussifer that, that I've always thought is that um, like how much comedy there is in it. But then it's it's not just this, is it? It's it's everything you do, and it just seems like it gets missed at times. Do you feel that way? Um, I th I could see that with the other projects, yeah. um, some of the comedy being missed uh, cause because it is it is, it is subtle. It's there. Yeah. Uh, but with you know with Pussifer, it's it's a little bit more up in your face. If you don't, yeah. you know, if you don't get the Andy Kaufman, Monty Python elements of this project, uh, you're asleep or something. I don't know. That's how it started, right? As w was it on Mr. Show? Was that the first thing? No, there, actually, was Pussifer it? was actually we were already doing stuff with Laura Milligan in the local uh, local comedy club. Okay. Uh, it was called her show was called Tantrum, kind of a multi you know multi. Uh, kind of variety show yeah. uh, with a lot of comedians kind of working out their bits and working out their parts in this kind of very safe comedic setting uh, with peers and, and you know there's people coming with pay to see the show as well but a lot of early upstarts at that in that venue with uh, Brian Posehn, Patton Oswalt, uh, Blanket Patch, uh, Craig Anton, uh, Bob Odenkirk, David Cross, Kathy Griffin, wow. Janine Garofalo. Um, I think uh, Will Ferrell actually came through with Simpatico at one point. Yeah. Uh, Tenacious D would usually close the show on odd nights. 
So it was quite a, you know, before you even heard any of these names, the, this is what we were, we were doing in these clubs. And Pussifer was kind of the other band that was kind of closing the show when Tenacious D wasn't. Uh-huh. I think it's interesting because, like, I listen to, um, you know, like I listen to Rogan or, or Duncan Trussell and, and, and Mark Maron as well. And it's that world is like it's something I really appreciate and I've grown up with as well, but not in the same way. I mean, and it's it's interesting to see them talk about, um, you know, the sort of progression of how they got into each comic from the next guy in the same way that most people get into music and, you know, mm-hmm. you discover a few bands to start with. And But um, I've heard you talk about stuff that comedy's played a real big part in in your life when you're growing up, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Quite a bit, you know, I was watching Monty Python, or, I mean, of course, way back in the day, yeah. you know, you're up late night uh, to watch Benny Hill just to see if you can catch yeah. a boob run by the TV. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, comedy was, you know, watching Monty Python and um, Woody Allen stuff back back then. It was, I could see the comedic elements of Woody Allen and yeah. living in Ohio. I was definitely an island. I don't know how I got it, and my my friends didn't, but because it's not like my parents grew up with it. Did, is that ever something that you'd? I mean, this is your outlet for that, I guess, in that in that in that way, because it, it seems like it really seems like it's a it's yeah been like quite a, an important part of your sort of growing up. Yeah, I could never do. Yeah, you know, I think the sketch comedy stuff and doing little you know clever bits and putting on a wig and do those things. That's very that's safe comedy you know we can kind of explore our own little areas and do little film bits and whatnot it's very it's fun it's not nearly as daunting and challenging as the as the guys who choose the life of stand-up that's just a brutal a brutal life choice i think those guys are troopers for getting out there and, and enduring that kind of criticism and judgment and you're just up there by yourself and yeah. make me laugh oh my yeah. <laughs> I already failed. <laughs> I find, I, yeah, I mean, you know, I look at solo performers, you know, singer songwriters and stuff, and and I think that you know, I can't get my head around that. But just just to be there, that open and exposed, and just people like this, mm-hmm. expectant, horrendous. Yeah. But um, it's a fascinating thing, and it and it it does seem to have like from an outside perspective I think played an important part in it especially like you can see in the live show with this was that um, so that you, there was no desire to go into that then as far as just comedy straight playing yeah. in a comedy I mean if that if that would have taken off I mean when I was actually doing it yeah. uh, I mean I think everybody has this idea that you know Perfect Circle or Tool just kind of yeah it just started and it was huge yeah it's not really the case it was no. you know in that during that period of time I was there was some traction with the comedy stuff, and there was a little bit of traction before that with the music, but it wasn't necessarily an established thing. It could have been... So it could have gone either way, do you It think? could have gone either way right at that moment. Um, and, you know, looking at the people that I was working with as comedians at that point, um, it's not like I couldn't have done that and gone that way. Yeah. Um, but the other one just kind of took off and took more of my time and was paying the bills, so I went that way. I think there's definitely parallels between those two worlds, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the amount of time, you know, some of the stuff that I had in mind for Pussifer early on, we just couldn't couldn't afford to do it back then. You'd have to have a big deal, and if it didn't go, they own all your material and, yeah. you know, huge budgets and kind of stuff we get away with now. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. I it's mean, all it's a big show. edited on your laptop, and, you know, there's no big, huge catering budget, and you can do animation, you can do film. Uh, without having to have a million dollar budget and some producer and a studio involved. So back then though, 95, 94, you couldn't do that. Back then it was, you would have to have some kind of underwriters or some kind of sponsors to yeah. get that going. And that would have just... Uh, and the technology wasn't there yet either. So Yeah. I mean, that is a beautiful thing these days, I guess. As, as horrendous as the internet is as a place or an entity. Yeah, well, it's a good, you know, the internet... Love it or hate it, it's it's a really interesting uh, look into human nature and kind of where you are as a culture. Um, just traveling already, just two shows in the UK, and it's 
uh, apparent to me that your education your education system here is far superior to the one in the U.S. just because of the the nature and structure of the comments uh, on Twitter feed on Facebook. Um, it's uh, it's clear that you invented the language. <laughs> yeah, perhaps maybe it's just that you you have the the more discerning people commenting. No, I mean we all have our we all have that side of our culture. But uh, I think it's just it's an interesting it's it's just an interesting observation to see that the eloquent, thoughtful um, enthusiasm expressed through social media has been very inspiring for me uh, for this for this visit. It's been uh, yeah, yeah it, makes me, it makes me want to come back. So yeah, do you think there'll be much more of it than touring here? With, with I don't know. Stuff? I mean, when we get into the you know when we get into Netherlands and Germany, I have no idea. How that'll go, but uh, but the UK absolutely it makes me want to come back. I want to do you know Glasgow. I want to go yeah. you know up into Dublin. I want to get I want to get all over uh, all over the islands and just uh, dive in because I think it's a this, I think this is a good market because we're you know we're such it's a cornball unit. I mean the you know the this, the music's there. We're 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 focused on making sure that we deliver yeah. through our songs, our music, and the vocals. Um, but the comedy element. It's it's night and day that the appreciation for comedy in the U.S. Uh, is so sophomoric compared to the appreciation for comedy in the U.K. So I feel like some of our cornball stuff, you guys get it. Yeah. And that's more appreciated here. But when, when you play over in the States, it's the same show, though, essentially, right? You're not, yeah. You're not but a lot of stuff goes right over people's it. heads. They miss it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is weird. But I would have thought that um, that the people that are coming to see the band are going to be the ones that that are the more. You would think that. <laughs> yeah, I would. Um, but easily, you know, there, I've had so many comments from people saying, you know, we have a song called, you know, "The Life of Brian." Apparently, you haven't seen, um, and mm. it's basically if you've seen the you know, life of Monty Python's The Life of Brian as many times as I have I guess maybe it's just because I'm obsessed but even if you've seen the film there's a whole there is kind of a thrust to the movie yeah um, you know that you know you're all individuals that whole scene and I mean that's the whole movie really it's yeah. all the way through the movie um, and people in the US they don't understand the connection what the song has to do with that movie wow it's like Oh my God! I don't. I don't have the the time in a day to help you with that. Yeah. How can you not tie that together? Yeah. So it's really. That's when you just kind of go. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, wow. You're gonna that's, drive me to drink. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's funny because, like, you know, it's so it's so obvious in in certain places, like um, in the arsonist, like the Beavis reference and stuff. I love that last night as well. With the corn holio, mm -hmm. I have a thing for that. And I just, I was just sketching while you were doing it and stuff. But um, you went to art school, right, in Michigan? Yeah. And and do you think because it seems like with with Pusfer, it seems like you're like not well, not that yet any of the other projects have these boundaries, but it just seems like this one is it, it, it can just go anywhere. Yeah, I mean I, that was that was kind of what the project was meant to be. Yeah. Initially, was uh, just an outlet for the things you weren't allowed to do anywhere else, regardless. You know, never mind the bands. Just like in general, for mm. friends of mine, musicians that you know, want to just, you know, we want to be a hardcore band this week. Okay, let's just go be a hardcore band. Mm. Um, you know, do yeah. ACDC, top to bottom. Just do a song, you know, do a whole set of that. Yeah. And have people go, Oh yeah, it's Pussifer. Deal with it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the yeah, there's very few other bands that I can think of that can do that and yet, you know, deliver these records that are um really artful and, and beautiful records. Yeah, I think that's and that's the only way we can get away with it. Honestly, I think we have to we have to deliver the music properly. Yeah. Or at least entertain you with the music, even with the old, you know, some of the earlier country stuff that we did. It was, you know, jokey. It still has to be, you know, fun to listen to. If, you, yeah, if it's not fun to listen to, you're not going to stick around for very long. Yeah. You know, when you were studying art and stuff, did you did you ever think? 
did you see it that I mean what where were you headed with that just out of interest were you looking at because what did you study was it fine art right yeah it was uh, uh, printmaking okay um, a little bit of sculpture kind of of course all your drawing and perspective classes I think those are invaluable for me yeah um, just you know, in general as a just an expressive artist uh, just understanding those techniques even though I don't necessarily use them you know directly yeah. with this but you know standing I, back and looking at our stage you know you're definitely there's oh yeah there's uh, there's there's broad sweeps of those yeah definitely those compositionally and, and yeah thematically. the composition is everything um yeah but i didn't really yeah the art school was it was an interesting experience and it taught me those things but printmaking was uh what i kind of got into because i just kind of enjoyed the process yeah what type of steps. print was it uh, Italio, so I was doing a lot of copper etching. Oh, nice. Yeah, so, you know, messing, make, making my own inks and, you know, doing all the etching process. Do you still draw? Not really. No? No. Do you not have the desire? Are you, are you satisfied? Because I find that, um, because I, I, I paint a bit and, you know, I, I play music a little bit as well. And I find that, um, it, it's almost as if I have only this is a failing obviously but I only have so much that I can focus on mm -hmm. and and it's not like a I don't mean that in a, I can't multitask kind of way well I can't but I mean in in the sense that like I become so obsessed with if I'm working on music then the painting really falls behind mm -hmm. um, and, and vice way. versa yeah, especially you know combining you know writing for three bands and having you know being a winemaker and it, it, it is the, the winemaking is very hands-on, so that process, although it's very utilitarian and it's very physical, there's still an artistic side to it, and you have to have some intuition and you know natural instincts to really uh, make that work. Um, and they're not going to work if you're not paying attention. Yeah, so definitely. Even if you have the instincts and if you have the natural talents for it or the inclinations for it, uh, it's not going to work if you're not present for it. So. Yeah, so I guess you're right. I think a lot of those things end up kind of falling away, the drawing, the painting, the printmaking. You don't have the bandwidth to do them if you're yeah. really going to focus on the other things. And and has the winemaking, has that got to the point where have there been times where 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 music's fallen away because you're so focused on that? As you said, it's um, such a no, because that's always, well. you know, the music's always kind of, you know, rattling around in my head. Yeah. Um, just kind of thinking about processes or approaches to things. Um, it's always there, um, you know, because there's a lot of downtime during yeah. the winemaking process. Yeah, I guess because it's a it's a seasonal thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And certain things happen at certain times. Yeah, even but even during the season, when we're processing, I have that you know those three hours window of just being able to sit and listen or write or you know because that's that's you know writing is that process. You know, I'm not sitting there 24 hours a day writing shit, stuff down. Yeah, I'm having to like. You know, take a minute, think about it, let it marinate, and come back. Hmm. And how, when you're writing, are you do you sit and specifically work out what you're going to be writing for, or, or is it you find a home for things once it's done? Oh uh, no, I, I'm always writing to rhythms or or you know okay. pieces of melodies. Yeah, there's always something that's been recorded, a, a, a jam that. of some sort, or. Uh, yeah, depending on the project, some things have to be finished arrangements. Others have to be, yeah. you know, initial thoughts with simple structures. It's you know, it's all very fluid. Yeah, as a time management thing, it is it's mind blowing for me to see, especially when you know I, I watch the film and um, to see the process of, of of that goes into the the wine making and the growing right. and the you know, the grafting of vines and how how did that come about um you know that sounds not i'm not this is not a dismissive statement um but it's, i think the wine wine making kind of chose me yeah and i know that sounds like i'm making it up but no um, I, I totally understand yeah i think i just kind of fell into it i have a natural instinct for it um and uh it came very easily uh, and I saw a lot of potential with it, especially for our region. So I just kind of, I kind of dove in. I felt like 
if, if I have the natural instincts to pull this off, I probably should really pursue it because our area needs it. We got a lot of potential there. Yeah. So it was a calling of sorts. I guess, yeah. 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 So I know that there was a huge amount of trial and error with finding the right, the right things for the right area. For the it's soil. still going what on. Was, yeah, yeah. It's that's going to be a that's another ten year, twenty year process of us really trying to figure it out as a as a state. Wow, that's such a, having that long term outlook. On yeah, it. when when we actually figure it out and we've actually seen the results and and have proven them for the third time to be right, I won't even be around. It'll be it'll be just it's a it's more of a legacy. You're, just, yeah. you're kind of literally planting roots for the future. And is that an is that an important aspect of why you do it, or is um, that just yeah, a, an yeah? I think I think that's that's something that uh, you know over here you you guys have endured world wars, you know, trudging across your soils, you know, mm. not even you know even pre World War One and two, just like the you know the areas combating uh, combative forces, just try to secure their areas. Um, and even with all that going on, the areas that seemed to kind of just weather all that storm were the ones that had some pretty solid wine coming out of them. There's like a they're like a hub. They're an anchor okay. for you know the guy who raises goats, the guy who works on machinery. There's all these little things that you know. Yeah. The you know baking bread. It all ends up being these little things that can kind of hang their hat on this yeah. secure long-term endeavor which is the winemaking and the vineyards they they there's so much time and some commitment uh attached to those and it seems that those particular areas don't care king queen dictator general president they don't really care who's in charge or in theory for them who's in charge is the wind and the sun hmm and the rain so that's they're kind of marching to that beat um and it it transcends the politics there's something quite mystical about it as well without wanting to sound too but i i think the idea of the history of it and and it, when you go back into the the mythology of it as well mm -hmm. it's it's really rich and it and, and vibrant and and it resonates do you, is that something that also? Yeah, I definitely, I definitely, you know, have to nod your hat to that a little bit because yeah. there's definitely a, there's probably a reason a lot of that's sewn into the the practices, and the stories, just because there is, there is some kind of long term commitment residence to it, um, and of course everything, everything has its foundation, everything has its origin, so there's probably some, you know, there's probably something to it if they're in those religions, if there's all those stories kind of have the. Yeah the winemaking and the vine metaphorically or literally yeah there's something to it yeah definitely and i think it's interesting as well like a lot of your um aside from from the vineyard being called merkin which <laughs> can't help it yeah but caduceus as well sort of alludes to that i think and also a lot of the names of, of some of the wines like anubis and naga and nagual and kitsun and chupacabra not that one's quite so much because that one's a little more uh <laughs> yeah the american the american wines tend to a little bit more playful yeah but that i mean there's there's a lot of sort of references to these sort of anamorphic beings yeah is that um, like a, is, i mean it's obviously it's not coincidence i guess no no not at all yeah there's there you are we are trying to connect you know our feet to the ground and our hands to the heavens yeah so yeah <laughs> and that's essentially what, what, yeah, what the vines are themselves, aren't they? Yeah. I heard you saying in another interview, and I'm probably quoting it wrong, but where you said, um, I, I think this kind of ties in for me anyway. Uh, it, it's kind of bouncing around a bit. Where you said that, um, that if you don't believe in magic, then um, then your art's probably going to suck. Yeah, you have to have. I think you know you kind of have to buy into something bigger than you yeah to really kind of you know I think see I would find it hard to to comprehend that people make music and not look at it that way but it, yeah, they clearly are there's people making music because they want to 
bang chicks and yeah but those guys don't last long true generally speaking God uh, <laughs> it doesn't that's very short that's very short lived um, if that's your focus um, yeah because I, th- I think all art and music comes from that place however you want to dress it up mm-hmm. like you know it, it is very much opening yourself up to things and and whether you want to call that a muse and and being inspired or whether you want to really get kooky with it and call it channeling yeah, and but I, th- I, I think that's kind of the point of a uh, you know going back to uh, life of Brian I think people start they what they do is they confuse uh, the finger pointing at the bigger idea they get focused on the finger rather than the bigger idea yeah so I think some people when they have those moments and they and they get caught up in whatever rock star lifestyle that is that they they had a moment that something connected and they saw something bigger and they kind of pursued that and it got popular then you kind of get derailed you get, you're so focused on the reward from having had that moment yeah you forgot how to get back in that headspace and and honor that moment with a few more and is that is that your driving motive then yeah just uh just to continue to um put together those pieces that are like metaphorical breadcrumbs not not that they're going to lead anywhere, but the, you know they're. It's just I think that's kind of the, that is the life pursuit, isn't it? There is no answer. You just kind of continue asking better questions and having fun on the way. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I think you, that, that that's very clearly part of everything that you've done musically. Um, yeah, there, there's you know I could probably count on my hand the amount you know I like a lot of different bands so this isn't me talking shit about bands in general obviously but you know there you know there are certain bands that that feel like they're more than just scary room write some songs guys you mm-hmm. know well most you know not again I'm not begging on modern you know the current state of music um, yeah. but. I mean, why wouldn't you at this stage in the game when nobody actually pays for music and there's no nothing to nurture you, a space to nurture a garage band style setting where you can actually nurture and find your way uh, without anybody interrupting you, um, without having to have a budget to you know pay for some gorgeous rehearsal space that's all licensed and insured and all those things. I mean, back in the day, we were living, you know, we find the old warehouse downtown and pay the caretaker 10 bucks a month to just let us yeah. not burn the place down but get stuff done um, and you don't have that anymore and so why wouldn't you just pick one song that was popular that you guys can actually pull off and do an entire album that sounds like that one popular song you like hmm. and that's your whole identity is not even a, not even like identifying with a band but like identifying with a single song from that band and then making an entire album that sounds like that song to get popular yeah i, I you know i don't i don't that's not what i'm going to do but i can see why you know young bands coming up that's yeah. that's their that's their process they're no, they're no songwriting they're just going to take an old song and regurgitate it in different ways 12 times yeah I mean there is a lot of that but as you said that stuff generally does fall by the wayside pretty quick yeah hopefully but <laughs> yeah it is so if if that's the mindset then how like how have you gone about finding the people you work with each time because I, kn- I know that with Tool it was it was one thing and that and I guess that would have been the, the basis of establishing y- you as an artist so that other artists would then kind of look over and go is it is it that people gravitated towards you or how do you how have you gone around choosing like the lineups for, especially for for Pussifer because it's well Pussifer is definitely a, a combination of those things because a lot of the people that I'm working with still behind the scenes in Pussifer were the people that I was working with with comedy yeah. back in the day not necessarily uh, uh, as a result of the music career yeah. um just you know the animators and some of the writers and uh, you know, Laura Milligan, of course, uh, on the cover of the Conditions yeah. uh, album. You know I've been working with her for you know twenty twenty two years. Um, I guess some of that because of the popularity. Yeah, you have to. You can definitely leverage some of those things to kind of lay out a little bit of a, a beacon. 
you know, yeah. throw up your bat signal to kind of get people <laughs> to come around. Yeah, that's why I imagine it's um, like somewhat. But yeah, but even so, like not, you know, it's definitely a, a weeding out process because, you know, especially living in an area like I don't know when I was living in L.A., hmm. it draws a lot of flies too. So you really have to weed out yeah. who you're actually going to work with, um, people you can trust that are going to make the right artistic decisions uh decisions with integrity and um it's been it's been a long it's a long hard process and you don't always make that right choice uh but with the projects that i've been involved with i've been very very blessed with yeah with being able to see most of the the douchebags coming uh yeah. and settling in on quite a few awesome awesome talented people i mean i there's no way I could do everything I'm doing if I didn't surround myself with the talent of people that I surround myself with. Uh, you know, I love, I would love to take credit for all this stuff. I can I cannot take credit for half of it. There's just a lot of really good people around me. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's a talent to be able to pull those people in and, and then to get the best out of them. Yeah. Something with, with this is like the, initially as well i mean obviously having you know saying coming through through comedy and and having bits and 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 recording film stuff so that there would be different looks but it's something that you've always done do you find that that um is that what's the motive for some of that is that like to keep yourself amused is it to to blow people's minds on what they presume you're going to be about like the different characters almost and the different looks or is it actually does it actually serve a purpose for when you're creating do you I know think what it's I mean? just I think it's just upbringing yeah uh, you know early on I just remember uh, I don't know if it was over here but like in the US you had a lot of uh, like, like laugh in you had the Sonny and Cher show you had yeah. Hee Haw I don't know uh yeah. Hee Haw was like a lot of a lot of like you know country sketches. Okay. And but it was then you had Roy Clark playing guitar uh, for yeah. a bit where he's just shredding on the guitar, or a banjo player would come on, or you know just really amazing music, along with these really funny, you know, recurring characters and recurring yeah. themes. You know, same thing with Sonny and Cher. They would have the variety. They were the odd guest on. Then they would do a song and. Or they would do little bits, uh, laughing, yeah. same thing. It was just all mm. over the map. Yeah, um, we had the equivalent here, I guess. You know, to a lesser, not not as much music, of course, but Vic and Bob, you know. Yeah. You know, stuff like that where, like, it's, it's, it's there's a lot of character-driven things. Um, more recently, you know, Little Britain and... Yeah. But those don't really have the music, so it's, you, you know, Monty Python had a couple songs, yeah. but it was definitely more of the performance sketch-driven things but, you're, you're but when i grew up it was more it was more of a balance like hee-haw had music and the yeah. comedy all intertwined so it's not anything i'm i'm not really and i'm not reinventing the wheel on this i'm just trying to no, yeah. bring it a little bit you know bring it back in, in some way i think i think there's a nice balance with that and you know i've got two bands that are just bands yeah if i'm going to do a third it better be something different yeah but even in those bands i mean that you you know you would you would have very specific looks and some of them like you know i remember seeing those shows where you'd come out in full like weird kabuki face makeup with a huge bra on <laughs> you know thank you that is a beautiful thing it's a, <laughs> it's a wonderful image but i mean you know that was blowing people's minds but I mean, was that what I mean? Is is that was that the intention to go? We're not this band that you think we are, or 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 is it a case of putting on a ma putting on a mask almost allows you to do certain things that you wouldn't have done creatively otherwise? Is, I think is both. What I was, yeah, I think both. Yeah, it really does. Uh, you know, it really does open up uh, performance possibilities when you're when you're writing songs that are very close to the heart, but then you yeah. can kind of put the mask on and kind of dance around like the clown and go, but it's all going to be okay. Okay. It's all going to work out. Okay. Because I spoke to Jazz Coleman recently for one of these. From Speaking Kim of nutcakes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Lovely guy. Yeah. He, he is, um, 
he likes to get into it <laughs> <laughs> he was blowing my mind man yeah you know i have a lot of those interests and I, I i said he was on the podcast and and the thing was i said in the intro is i felt like my i don't want to sound like a crazy person filter just turned off like it was this palpable thing where it was i could feel it and, and it was like okay we can talk about anything anything um but so he he had some really interesting stories about magic especially but he was also telling me about you know the, the the persona that he he literally becomes it's not he he it's almost like a ritualistic invocation of becoming this guy that he is when he's on stage yeah absolutely yeah you have to you have to get out of the way and let and let the and let the energy just kind of come through yeah. and the best way to do that is to get the hell out of the way and do you think putting putting things absolutely. on absolutely that's the that's the doorway that's the that's you getting out of the way tuning in in a, in a different way mm -hmm. when did you discover that that was the that was going to be the because it's quite an intuitive thing isn't it obviously and when, as soon as you start playing with archetypes when you're when you're um i mean it is a ritualistic thing i i mm -hmm. very much see it that way a lot of people think it, it sounds like bollocks when you start talking about that stuff and they think you're nuts but whatever I'm not sure where I first discovered it, but you know, most of my early upbringing was uh, were uh, in high school. Of course, were sports. You know, sport activities that uh, were all you. I mean, there's nothing you can't hide behind anything. You couldn't ride the pine and uh, just kind of uh, be a part of the team, but without actually doing anything. Hmm. Uh, for you know, as a wrestler, yeah, that's you. I mean, that's you're 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 competing against yourself, um, your own will and another person who's trying to enforce their will on you so and there's no hiding it's that's that's the two of you out there doing that yeah. uh, did you prepare or did you not um how did you do against yourself how did you do against him um same thing with cross country you can't coast it's yeah it's either you're either finishing the race or you're not um, you can't rely on somebody else to carry you or you know hope you know looking for a michael jordan on your team to kind of you can't this yeah this guy you can't do it. that yeah um but i think in in contrast from the arts um it's still kind of you having to deliver but i think there's um uh, having that channeling whatever that larger idea that magic kind of coming through it's it's a different thing much different um than having to be focused and present like you would have to be for as a wrestler or cross country runner. Yeah. But then performance is quite in the moment at the same time, so it's almost like it's like flipping between the two, right? Yeah. Um, kind of. Yeah. There's an in and in and out of body. Yeah. That can be kind of exhausting. Um, I don't know. Like, yeah. It's, it's hard. I'm, you know, I'm the, I'm in the middle of it, so I don't know. It's, yeah, I guess so. It's kind of hard to describe it. Yeah. And even if I did, if you, unless you've experienced it, that's not going to mean anything. Yeah. But then, yeah. Oh no, I hear what you're saying. But I think that that the opportunity to lay down those sort of signposts almost for other people, yeah. because you know, as you said earlier, there's there's a lot lacking in in not not music in general, but you know, just in in a lot of art well living essentially there's a lot missing in people living these days but i think that maybe to lay down those signposts makes would make things clearer for people but then i think that's that's what the music is essentially anyway right yeah uh, it, it, you know an unconscious map yeah that hopefully you can kind of lay down some basic ideas of how to figure it out for yourself but here's a basic map <laughs> do you feel do you feel like well, I, you don't strike me as this type of person that would feel obliged in any way to the to the people. No, that sounds wrong. Are you aware of the expectation when when people come and see you perform? Because I feel that um, because as you know, like in the, in the same way as you saying that when you're finding people that you want to collaborate with mm -hmm. and and make art, it's like throwing up the bat signal for want of a better description but then I think that 
there are certain artists that 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 are doing that constantly to the point that that their their fan bases and the people that are interested in what they're doing are almost uh, expectant. So uh, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I got lost. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know. It just feels like there's a lot of expectant weight on on the stuff that you do and and artists as well that I would sort of. Yeah, I mean that's a hard, that's a that's a hard, a fine bit. line to tread. Of like, you're doing a thing and you've uh, you've established something, and people want to come back for more of that. Yeah. Again, I think it's the metaphor uh, conversation. Of, I had a friend of mine describe, she was going to uh, a very loud kind of rock band was performing. Um, and she didn't really go to a lot of those shows. She's uh, really into the Kundalini yoga, and she's up, you know, doing breath of fire every morning yeah. at f- five a.m. or four a.m. Okay. Um, so she went to this very loud show, and just some of the aggressive nature, and you know, expectant and uh, fervent nature of the of the fans. It all made sense to her because she's watching these people react to this to this band, and she said, "I get it." they they come here because whatever noise or whatever story is coming off that that stage is moving something in them that they can't move themselves yeah the problem with that is that the band wasn't teaching them how to fish yeah here's a fish eat it yeah yeah they're handing them the fish um and so I, you know, I, I could see that. Uh, like that's you, you're so when people are like angry at me for not giving them the things that they want, it's I feel like I failed as an artist because mm-hmm. I haven't taught them how to f- fish in a way. You're looking for something from me. Like I, I don't, I don't. If you're if you're, if you're waiting for somebody like me who's just as confused as you are, yeah, we're all fucked. You know. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. If I, if I if we accidentally gave you a thing one day to help you with a, with something, <laughs> and you're waiting for the next thing. Oh my god. Yeah. We're all doomed. Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't have it. <laughs> I don't have the answer. Yeah. But I, you know, so to but to her point, like you know, I could see that she got that some people just weren't. There's just some people that are never gonna end up figuring out a way to move that thing in themselves. Although, if I had a message for anybody, it would be look at look at yourself to f- see what it is you think you need from somebody, and realize that's something you have to develop in yourself. Yeah. If there's anything I can share, that would be it. Figure out what you see as you know, figure out what it is you're needy about, and fix it in yourself. Get your shit in order and deal with yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I saw that that you have the book coming out in um, in November. Mm-hmm. What was the um, what was the the why now and, and what was the reasoning behind that? Because you know, to be honest with you, you I, I was I was overjoyed that we're getting to do this now because it just seemed like it wasn't something that you did an awful lot of. And mm. and I think putting a book out there is and it's <laughs> fuck um, to put out an <laughs> awesome to put out an autobiography is is really that's that seems like the antithesis of of what again people well the way assume. it's written it's not uh, it's not necessarily an autobiography it's no. not it's not a kiss and tell novel it's definitely it's written that's why that's why I used. Uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Sarah Jensen, she's the older sister of my high school friend, and she's you know she's a writer and she's very diligent in her research. Yeah. Um, and the reason I worked with her on it is because we were going to write it like a story. So you're not nece- it's not necessarily it's one version of my life story. It's not it's not necessarily all the details of everything that's ever happened. It's one particular trail of breadcrumbs yeah. that we follow as a storyline. And you're walking along with the person in the story, like you're reading a fantasy novel. Okay. So it's not necessarily, uh, and then I did this, and then I did that. Mm. Um, so it actually, it's 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 kind of a, a a story of a journey. 
so this is November. It's due. Yeah, it's it's, it's just it's, done. It's, yeah, it's done. Yeah. It's all done. It's all it's going through all the processes mm-hmm. that things go through, uh-huh. um, and it's scheduled for November release. Were you approached about this, or was it something you? Wanted oh no, this to is do? something. It was you know my it was approaching my fiftieth birthday, and I thought it might be good to lay down the foundation of a particular semi autobiography. Yeah. Uh, story um, to you know to just do something to commemorate yeah. a 50th year so we kind of started writing it right around my 48th 49th year just to see where yeah. we would go with it it took a little longer than I thought it would uh, take but you know again Sarah was really good at doing more of the pre my prehistory uh, due diligence like you know back to my uh, great great grand uh, parents, okay, uh, that that far to kind of bring the story that far back and forward. I read somewhere that that, that your great grandparents were winemakers as well. Is that right? Uh, my great grandfather was a he made wine in northern Italy, in northwestern Italy. Okay, yeah, Piemonte area, but and not, wine, not, in the, and not in the sweet spot, unfortunately. Kind nah. of more up into the up to the French Alps area. Was that something that, that that you were aware of when you were growing up, or is Not it just all. something that you've come? I, f- I found out about him way later. That's I was actually planting vines before I found out that wow that he was actually a winemaker, and and oddly enough, Italian vines do really well where I'm living now. So it just all kind of came around. That's part of that kind of winemaking finding me. Yeah, part of the story. Yeah, that's pretty magical. Wow, that's crazy. Um. I also read that, um, sorry, this is all a bit, I read this and I read that, <laughs> I apologize. Um, well, at least you can read. Well, exactly, I try. <laughs> I don't get on so well, but um, that uh, that you, you had a dream about a, a place of where you wanted to move to when you wanted to get out of L.A., is that right? Mm-hmm. And, then, and then when you described that, to, was it to Tim Alexander? Well, Tim Alexander doesn't remember that conversation. Okay. He doesn't remember me actually describing the place. Hmm. He remembers it as he just wanted to take me to the place. Okay. And then when I got there is when I recognized it as that place. So I think I got my wires crossed on me actually describing it to him. I don't I think he actually just he just took me to that place, not knowing that that was the place I was looking for. Wow. Which is even crazier. Yeah. Does that happen a lot? Oh yeah. Yeah. How so? Just in various things. Yeah. And it's a lot of it is a lot of it is just you being open to those things. Um, doing your own doing your work. Yeah. You have to be involved. You have to be conscious and present and moving. Yeah. Uh, you can't just let things happen. You've got to you know have a make your own fate. Mm. Um, but if you're open to it, uh, the universe will nod in your direction on occasion. It doesn't mean anything doesn't mean that there's any kind of big plan or doesn't mean if there's any, you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's mm. just it's just being in tune and being inspired by those moments where the universe nods and you just continue on your way. Yeah. But it gives you the awareness that that, that exists. Mm-hmm. And I think that's an empowering thing because then it will become more and more frequent as you become more attuned to it and, and start to give a lot more credence to these things yeah you can give credence to it but as far as like assigning meaning and purpose to it yeah that's then that's when you start religions and that's where it all goes sideways (laughs) yeah true yeah there's a big difference between the two things I think yeah I saw that um, there was a similar thing where where you said about um, where you had a dream about Bill Hicks Mm. and and contacted it was his management yeah then I let him call him and he's like oh yeah he's not in a good way yeah yeah so yeah. those those, th- those kind of things you know they happen again he had to be open open to those things actually happening yeah I think so and I, I sometimes I, re- I yeah maybe I, I I pay too much not pay too much attention to them but try and maybe I should just accept them at face value a bit too much well but you I, know I, if, you, if those things come into your life and you in those kind of moments and you kind of go off on a tangent and you Write an entire book, or, a, or do a you know song, or whatever you're gonna you know create from it, mm. and you go away to the edge. You get all Salvador Dali on it. That's fine, mm. you know. Um, everybody, everybody has their role. Everybody's you know you have to have the people that go too far. 
Yeah, so you know when to stop. Yeah, or yeah. You know, or you know, let them go too far. Or, you know, or some people are just risk takers and just go for it all the way. Yeah. Um, was is there any? You know, obviously, this all what everything this alludes to. I guess we're kind of skirting around it somewhat. Have you ever like? Is this all just personal uh, work? I guess, or have you ever sort of followed any sort of set? method or school along those lines or, or have you just like read a bunch and taken what you like I think you just I just take the bits I like and yeah. whichever kind of resonates with me I don't think there's any particular every every you know every religion has its there's you know there's things that make sense yeah that's why they end up resonating with people yeah it's all the other bullshit they end up kind of inserting into it that kind of ends up derailing people in a way to control you know, control land masses, you know, in pursuit of love and power. Yeah. Um, it's, it's never going to go away. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find it interesting as well that, like, going back to, you know, obviously your your history in the military is something that always gets spoken about. But it, it seems like... Well, I, kn I know that, that, that you, you know that you studied wrestling and I know that the 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 running was a was a bit, was a big part of your growing up as well so then they're both um very disciplined and regimented things but as I understand it like you know you you went to you joined the army for a college fund to go and study art right mm -hmm. yeah which is, is it seems almost like well it's you know yeah I don't know look in in hindsight I can't I can't understand why I made that choice, um, but I'm glad I did. Yeah. Just for the you know for the sake of balance, you know, I'd love to claim that I had it all mapped out and I knew what I was going to do, but that's that's just not ever that's not ever the case. No. Things just you know things happen or they don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <it's not> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a weird one though. To go in that into that world, because I that was something I I I thought I was going to do as well, not the army, but my my I have an elder brother who, who was in the fleet air arm, which was like you know like the planes and helicopters side of mm -hmm. of the Royal Navy, and he's a he's um he's I guess nearly ten years old, older than me, so yeah when I was growing up I was that was the thing as well, and and I I had it all worked out that that's what I was going to do you know I looked well, up I mean that's something we all struggle with we we have this idea that we're going to make this plan there's going to be this structure hmm. and it's just things are just going to be that way forever because you can there's comfort in having an idea what's coming <laughs> but it's just the world's just not like that yeah and, and many you know and then all of a sudden there's a meteor and everything changes or you know I mean just imagine and I don't know if uh, you had it over here, but I think you kind of have a version of it here. But in L.A., for years, if you're going to work on sets as a you know in production at all, yeah. uh, art dog, whatever you're going to do, you had to have this thing called a Thomas Guide. And basically, what it was is a map of the city, okay, broken up into grids. So the whole book was a page was you know C14 or whatever. Um, so you could find when somebody goes, we need you to okay. go pick up these lamps and you need to go to this particular place. Yeah. So this book, you would have to buy this thing and they weren't cheap. Hmm. And there was different versions of them. So for San Fernando Valley, for you know the, the LA County area, you would have these entire books as a driver or a guy running around grabbing all these things. As a runner, you would have to have this thing to find your way around to make sure that you got your, you, <laughs> you still had a job tomorrow. Yeah. You can find the route, you know, you had to figure out your best routes to get to these places and get them back. Now imagine that's your your company. That's your foundation. You put together this Thomas guide. You spent lots of money putting it all together. That's kind of the foundation of what your company is. And then along comes smartphone and maps and GPS. Yeah. That company's gone. Yeah. So people who hung their hat on this on this family business that's going to be around that's been around for generations hmm. is now gone. Within. Within five years, the record industry in general, just yeah. But then I think a lot of that is to do with the the short sightedness of the people involved, 
not the I don't mean the artists um but the labels themselves obviously well, but I, mean, I think you know, now but, that but what I guess my point is just like the things just using some of the music industry or that that you know that mapping just something comes along that changes everything so any plans you have about anything yeah. you can't really get married to any of those plans yeah. it just don't it just doesn't you know even even planting vines if the if the you know if the environment in some way shift as it has as 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 history has shown us yeah. ice ages and, and and whatnot uh extreme things happen so whatever you had in mind that was that was a clever <laughs> it was a clever plan you had yeah and then it's all turned on its head so if you just kind of embrace that i think that's the hardest part for most people to get is that whatever changes are coming um for the environment or whatever whatever yeah uh the next phase might not include us and that's the hardest part for us to wrap our head around is yeah. that we mean we're not a part of the next phase maybe not maybe I agree. not I mean you look at the like Kurzweil's vision of what the future is going to be and he's got this really rosy idea that everybody's going to be interfaced with their you know they're these supercomputers and there's been nanobots all in it but no it's not that so you're going to create something which is going to go one simple one guys simple guys have really fucked this up you're done one simple uh, burst from the sun oh yeah and EMP erases all of those things and we don't have the faintest idea how to tie our shoes yeah we're screwed there's so much so much technology we rely on yeah that you know you can't download the app to show you how to start a fire with flint you know is that is that one of the reasons that um is that that's obviously something that that's really important to you though then going going out to arizona and and and, and working the land and actually being in contact with it and, and understanding it and having this this life because mm -hmm. it, it is it is it's so true people have and i say people like i'm oh, i'm not one but i you know everybody is is so embedded now in this you know like hive like thing of living in a city and just expecting to go and have food delivered to here and no thought of, of what's going into their bodies and it's crazy well you know I like the idea of settling into the idea that in my lifetime that won't change you know just kind of embrace it and roll with it hmm. um but I think it will. It'd be kind of interesting to live through a period where that's not the case, and 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 get to you know, while I'm starving in a corner. Go, I told you so. <laughs> yeah. You know. Build a compound. Start yeah. stocking up tins of beans. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's a crazy one, man. Like I, I was listening to um, on a drive. I've got like a, I signed up to Audible, and was just listening to um. Bill Bryson's uh, a short history of nearly everything and he's talking about the whole thing about meteors mind blowing yeah no I mean there's so many I mean if you start looking at you know some of those some of that science the amount of times in the last 20 years that we almost had a, a solar flare that was that yeah. EMP like that we barely narrowly escaped hmm that thing and I'm not you know I'm not necessarily a doomsday guy but I just think it's funny how those things are happening all the time but everything we've hung our hat on as far as part of our culture and yeah um even just our our you know our energy and utility systems being hinged on some very simple yeah yeah it's, but it's a it's it's kind of daunting as to what yeah. would happen in that but you know again It'll be a temporary in the in the in the scope of time. It'll be a temporary blip. You think? Yeah. It'll, you know, whatever would happen, of course, it'll be it'll be like an eternity for us living through it. But yeah. um, it'll sort itself out very quickly. Yeah, I'm a big fan of um, like Graham Hancock, and also uh, you know I like to subscribe to the whole ancient aliens thing. But you, you start looking back at those things and it's like, yep, slate's been wiped clean more than once before. Yeah. Which most people think sounds like just 
proper tin foil hat crazy talk, but no, there's much too much evidence for it. I think. Yeah, the idea that we've been here a lot longer. Yeah. Than we think we've been here hmm. is, I think that's a much easier pill to swallow than we just got here ten thousand years ago or whatever. And look at what we've achieved. We're doing great. Yeah. Yeah, I hmm. disagree. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, I think that's a good point to finish. <laughs> On a cheery note. Good. We we avoided any Trump conversations. Good. Yeah. I yeah. I didn't want to darken the. Fuck, man. <laughs> What what a world! I, see, I'm. I think now that that whole thing. Now you've started me off. Sorry. I think it's got to be a joke. It has to be. I'm just gonna see how far we can go with this. Okay, now. let's let's take think? it to a. I'm gonna put my I'm gonna put my tinfoil hat on. Okay. And I'm gonna talk metaphysically. <laughs> um. About it all. I'm gonna step way back. You can call me crazy. I'm just giving you the tinfoil hat. I'm all about it. Go. Version of this. We have moved from that patriarchal mindset into a matriarchal mindset. And I think there's a... You can talk to some of the woo-woos and they'll tell you there's like a cycle. I think it's a 10,000-year cycle or mm -hmm. something like that. And Which is very, you know, the, the patriarchal, warring, uh, you know, protective, uh, masculine yep. mindset. Um now we've moved, we've shifted now, uh, where it's not that survival mode as much anymore as it has been over the last thousands of thousands of years, and it's moved into a more matriarchal mindset. This is according to the woo woos. This is you know this okay. might again tinfoil hat talk. Um, so this could be um, just everything that's going on in the last you know ten years, fifteen years. Um, could be that last not not last dying gasp but definitely like a struggle for the old the old dogs in charge of you know above and beyond the yeah the scope of you know the governments and whatnot hmm. uh that's the it's like a it's a metaphor for that last gasp of that old mindset uh just going know. shit or bust yeah with the Trump thing, I just feel like that's kind of like that last, you know, that old th way of thinking hmm. is going to get loud. It's not going to go quietly into the night. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to shriek a little bit. Yeah. And that's what you're seeing, um, especially with all the religious, you know, ISIS and everything else. Yeah. Just that a lot of that's the same kind of thing. It's just really, um, it's more, it's more present. Um, and I'm not a big fan of, uh, any of the candidates really hmm. uh, but I feel like from a metaphysical stepping way out of it perspective um, I think the eight years of having the first African American president was a, is a step in the right direction spiritually never yeah. mind what do you think about the candidate or whatever was going on or hmm. his whatever was accomplished or not accomplished or undermined or whatever and that's not really the big point it's, so it's I think, the mindset that's I think yeah. you know, I don't really. I'm not a huge fan of Hillary Clinton either, um, but I feel like that's probably going to happen as the next logical step. On yeah, that. having a female president. It's yeah. as if nothing else, just a step in the right direction. Even though she might be an asshole, I don't know. Yeah, um, it might be what's going to happen. Yeah, because f from an outside perspective, yeah, no, it's interesting that you put it like that. I never really thought of it in that sense, as if this was like the last point before the wheel turns but it just seemed like it just seems so fucking ridiculous like it's n not just it's a comics corner yes Copia. of course to the point where it has to be scripted surely because it's like surely no one is that much of a fucking idiot please <laughs> I'd like to think Come, that's true anyway. It's not, it's, it, <laughs> but yes, we are that dumb. But it's, cr it's crazy. It's almost like it's someone's taken a bet, you know, one dollar. It feels <laughs> like, it's like this trading places thing where it's like, let's just see how far we can push this. Right. You know, which then, it, it, if that, it, well, either way, if that is the case, it's still terrifying. Right. Because it's 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 like it's stirring the, like the 
stirring the silt from the the bottom of the pond and all the shits rising up and and going yay. And again, it's the media. You know, the media is definitely to blame as far as really highlighting some of those things. But I think it's really important for that stuff to be out there so people see it. Yeah. I mean, the reason you study, you know, the reason you go visit Auschwitz or Hiroshima is so that you're gonna forget that yeah. that we're absolutely capable of those things. We're, mm. There's nothing different about us now than that was I mean, that whatever how we were wired three thousand years ago. There's nothing different about us. Hmm. It's not like we've all of a sudden gotten better as human beings. We're still capable. Of those. We're still doing those atrocious things to each other right now. Yeah. Whatever you read about in the history books, we're still doing it. It's not like it was something that happened back then and now we're better people. Hmm. Um, so we're capable of all those things. So it's not it's not out of the realm of possibilities that that the people you're talking about and the things you're witnessing in the media... Yeah, there. Of course, that's us. Of course, that's that's everywhere. Yeah, they're they're just you don't see it as often because you just don't. Why would you nurture that? Yeah, and it's in all of us. It's not this. It's not necessarily. You know, education oh. definitely, and you know, uh, economics and education have a play a huge part. Um, and of course, the whole you know teaching a man to fish. Yeah. Or just handing yeah. a fish definitely doesn't help, but um, yeah, yeah, on a purely biological level, the way that the human brain is built, you know, the very center of it, top of the brain stem, is is the R complex, which is that's a that's a lizard's brain. Like you know, it's just it's pure aggression and stupid instinct, I guess. Yeah, so yeah, it's never gonna. And I would, you know, so yeah, that's my that's my tin hat version of that of this election is that. And, you know, but my cynical side is that they're all in it together and yeah, it's all, it's all, it's like, I don't doubt that, you know, my conspiracy theorist side of me says that Trump is basically hired by Hillary Clinton to, to throw this election. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the only fly in her ointment is Bernie Sanders, who is far more effective outside of that office than he would be in the office. So I'm not sure how that's going to work. Yeah. Yeah, he seems like the, definitely the best option. But, I, I but not if he's in, not if he's in that office. If he's in that office, his hands will be tied and he yeah. won't get anything done. Yeah. Something I, I only found out about the other day about Hillary was that she was um, recently campaigning on the whole total disclosure thing. And um, I, I'd, I'd watched like a load of um, Dr. Stephen Greer like lectures and stuff and... See, I, I do have a tinfoil hat, which I wear on a regular basis. That's fine. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. But, um, yeah, I, I heard that that was one of the things that she was campaigning on recently. And I think that there's enough people now that would be like, well, yeah, we need to know this stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah I, don't know, yeah, I don't know where... I have no idea where it's going to go. I'm just hoping it, I'm just hoping it doesn't go dark. I mean, you're in a, you're in a, in a good place, ge geographically, right? I'm surrounded by Republicans, generally speaking. Yeah. But they're all mostly farmers, so we get along because you know the vineyards are something that really erases those social, economic, yeah. religious, political lines. We're all working together toward, you know, somewhat common goals. Hmm. So we don't talk politics. Yeah, which is a beautiful thing. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks. Thank man. you. Thank you. Thank you to Maynard James Keenan, uh, and thank you to you lot for listening as well. Um, please subscribe on iTunes, leave a nice comment. That makes a big difference. Remember that the Pusfer album, The Money Shot, is out now. You should check that out if you don't already own it because it's fantastic. And you can follow the band online at Pusfer on Twitter and Instagram, etc. Um, the podcast is on at Swim Podcast. I'm on at Daniel P. Carter. Uh, and the next episode is going to be with Billy Gould of Faith No More. And then the one after.